going. Good Sunday so far. It's been a great Sunday. Hey, uh, when you uh, join a new family, uh, whether through marriage or or just kind of you wind up crashing on somebody's couch for a long time and you wind up being with them for a long time, you, you begin to pick up and notice things that are different in the way that they do things, right? So if you join a family, you get married, and, 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 you, and you, you be a part of their family, you start noticing differences. So with my in-laws, they celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve. That's their big Christmas holiday, whereas ours is Christmas Day. That was strange to me when I first got married. Uh, also, they make birthdays a real big deal, whereas my family does a little bit more of a muted birthday celebration. Uh, which disappointed me as a child. Now I'm not as big of a deal. But it's easy to pick up on like signs of dysfunction in a new family as well, because you're kind of coming in from the outside, right? Kind of signs of dysfunction, right? Like, like they call dressing stuffing. That's a sign of dysfunction, <laughs> right? They, uh, they, they do all sorts of strange things. They, don't, they like their bean, green bean casserole a certain way. For some reason, I'm very Thanksgiving-oriented right now. I don't really know what the, why that is. But no, seriously, there are signs of dysfunction in families. And we can all kind of identify what those signs of dysfunction are, right? Kind of, uh, there's a lack of encouragement in a family. It's a, it's a critical family. That's a sign of dysfunction. Families that don't build one another up. Families that don't love one another. Families that, that maybe don't show uh, physical affection. That can be a sign of dysfunction, right? So when you, when, you, when you see families, we're kind of able to list off maybe a few things that we can say that's kind of a dysfunctional family. But when it comes to a church family, are we as able to identify signs of dysfunction? Are we able to say this is a healthy church family and this is not what a healthy church family is? So we're starting a new series like Kelsey talked about. We're starting a new series today about what is the church. We are the church, Right? We are the church, and we want to know about what that is. So this week we're talking about us as a family. And, and because we're starting this, this new series, I want you to know the reason why we're doing this is because this year we're celebrating our 80th anniversary as a church. Been around since 1939, which is pretty awesome. That was before World War II, or right after World War II started. And it's an exciting thing. And so what we're doing is Jeff's going to have three weeks in October of, of delivering messages to the church. There's going to be a, a lunch on the lawn that we're going to do together. There's also going to be the Lord's Supper taken each of those three weeks together because we want to celebrate. We want to be thankful for what God has done for us as a local body of believers. And so what we're going to talk about today is how we as a family can identify what's healthy in a church. So if you're a guest today, this is a great time for you to be here. You're going to be able to evaluate what you see here at Park Cities. And say, yeah, this is a healthy church. I want to be a part of this. So we're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at faith. We're going to look at love. And we're going to look at sacrifice. And we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 today. And like I said, the first thing we're going to see is that we are a family. We're a family of faith. We are a family of faith. So there's not many ways to join a family. You can uh, be born into a family, right, by blood you're born into a family, or you get adopted by mutual agreement, or somebody comes along and adopts you. Maybe your family is a blended family, and so two families are kind of coming together to make one new unit. Or like I said, maybe you just crashed on somebody's couch for so long that they just consider you a part of the family or a part of the couch. Either way, you're a part of their family, right? Surprisingly enough, uh, it hasn't changed that much over the years. As much as our, our world has progressed, we haven't actually changed the ways that you join a family. Since the dawn of time, being born was how you got to be a part of a family. Adoption's been going on for at least since the Roman Empire. 
And then blended families have been going on since Abraham, at least. Abraham had a blended family. He had a son by, Ish, uh, by Hagar, and he had a son named Ishmael. And Ishmael had a stepmom named Sarah. It's a blended family. So when we, when we think about this, we know how to join families, but do we know how to join the family of faith? And John actually has some ideas on how this works. John tells us how we join the family of faith. Verse 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. This is what you've heard from the beginning. Now, when you read this, you might think, okay, from the beginning, like when they started believing. And that's, that's a fine and fair interpretation. But I think this beginning goes back even further. When John uses the word beginning, he often uses it, not all the time, but often uses it to talk about the beginning, like of everything. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. That's the very first part of John's gospel. He uses beginning in 1 John 2.7 to describe an old commandment that we've had from the beginning, that you love one another. So when you love one another, if this is an old commandment, this is an old commandment that was passed down in the Old Testament law, to love one another. He says, it's obvious that you will know if you're in the family of God, if you have love for the other members of the family of God. But Travis, you still didn't answer how I join the family. Well, he brings Cain and Abel into the discussion, and you don't get much more beginning than the first family, to talk about how you actually join the family of God. Look at verse 12. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. John tells us that it's by faith that you join the family of God. And you might be like, Travis, I'm I'm reading that. And it doesn't say faith anywhere in there. Where are you getting that from? Are you taking a verse out of context? Well, It says that Cain killed Abel because his own deeds were righteous, or sorry, were unrighteous. His own deeds were evil. Now, he did not kill Abel, and that made his deeds unrighteous. Do you get that? Do you see that? He was doing evil first, and out of that, he killed Abel. And so Abel's deeds were righteous. So what made the difference? Well, Hebrews 11.4 tells us. Hebrews 11.4 tells us what actually makes the difference. And as we turn there, we'll see what it is. There it is, right here. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. It's by faith. It's by faith that you join the family of God. It's by faith that, so Abel offers his sacrifice. Now, sacrifice is not what got him into the family of God. But he offers the best of what he has to offer. He's trusting that God is going to take his best and still supply for his needs, even though he doesn't have the best of what he had. And he's trusting God to do something with that and to take care of him. Cain, on the other hand, offers whatever he has left over. That's not faith. That's not faith. That's not what faith is is. Now again, faith is not a work. Even though it says deeds here, faith is not a work. It's a gift given to us by God. That's Ephesians 2.8. But our faith is evidenced by what we do, right? We talked about this last week. The things that we do in the body, the things that we do physically are evidences of what, what's in our heart, what's spiritually going on inside of us. And so physical action displays faith. That's James 2.26. And so Abel gives his first and his best because he is full of faith. And so for you to be joining the family of God, for you to join the family of God, you have to be characterized by faith. You have to be a person of faith. It's what transfers you from the family of Cain to the family of Abel or Seth. Seth is the replacement uh, for Abel in Genesis. This is what transfers you from the family of the world to the family of Christ. So what is faith? Okay, Travis, I want to join up. How do I do that? Well, there's a great quote that says, faith is ultimately a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us. I'm going to read that again. Faith is ultimately a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, both revealed in our minds and sealed upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Basically what faith is, is believing that God loves you and accepts you Not based on anything that you have done, but based on what Christ has done. We've all messed up. We've all screwed up. We've all made mistakes. We're born into sin. 
We're born into the family of Cain. But if we believe, if we trust that it doesn't matter that we've done those things because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and he forgives us for those things, God will accept us based on what Christ has done. And so the object of our faith is Christ Jesus, believing that we're accepted based on what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. But let's not forget that when you become a believer, you need to continue on in faith if you're going to be a part of the family of faith. You don't just believe once and then go about doing things the way you've always done them. No, you grow, you develop, you mature in faith. That's what it means to be in the family of faith. If you're going to be a part of the family of faith, you have to continue on in faith. You have to pursue faith. You have to chase after it. If we're going to be good family members, people in the church who are committed to one another, if we're going to be a healthy body of believers, we have to be people who grow in faith. And you might say, well, Travis, that's great. That's why I'm here today. I want to grow in my faith. But it's not that easy because there's verse 13. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Now, that kind of seems like a, like, a, like a rabbit that he's chasing here. But it's not because Cain and Abel are a great illustration of the fact that those who are unrighteous, those who are outside of the family of God, resent and are frustrated by the acceptance of the people of God. Cain was jealous. He resented the fact that Abel was accepted and he was not. And you might say, well, Travis, what does that look like in my day-to-day life? Have you ever told somebody that you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven? And was their response frustration? Was their response not Well, why do you think that you're accepted and your religion's accepted, but mine isn't? Again, frustration over the fact that you're accepted and their belief system is not. It's the same thing. Again, I'm not saying that they're they're murderous because of it, but there's resentment. There's resentment towards the church, towards the people of God, for their accepted status by Christ, or by God in Christ, and the non-accepted status of those around us. And this creates a set of antagonism. Basically, the world around you is designed to beat the faith out of you. It's a giant conspiracy. Now, this does not create an us versus them mentality. What it does create is I need you here. I need you around me. I need you near me. Because my faith is fragile. It often hangs by a thread. I often feel like I'm the only one. I'm probably the only one that holds to this. I'm the only one that believes this. But when I get in a room like this, or when I get with other believers, when I get into a a small group or a connect group, if I join one of the men's small groups that are starting up uh, this Saturday on September 28th, you're going to have breakfast and join a men's small group. If I get in a group with other believers, guess what happens? I'm not alone. That strand of faith becomes tied together with other cords. And we're stronger. We're together. I need you here. I need community. I need to believe with the family of faith because my faith is fragile and i guarantee it yours is fragile as well it doesn't take much in our circumstances to knock us off kilter in our pursuit of christ that's why we need each other work is long and tedious and difficult it can make me focus on the wrong things my family might be going through a difficult time i might be stuck in a sin struggle and i might think that god absolutely rejects me there's no way that he could love me But I know and I believe, based on what Christ has done, that he does accept me. But sometimes it's hard to believe that based on your circumstances. So any brothers and sisters in Christ to come around me and say, Travis, no, 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 no. He loves you. He accepts you based on what Christ has done. And if we're people of faith, we need to pray for each other. If we believe that God is benevolent towards us, that God has good things for us, and I come to you with a problem, I come to you with concern, I come to you with an issue, often what do we do? Man, that stinks. I'm sorry for you. Man, I'm sorry. That's a rough day. Bad break. Sometimes we'll say, hey, I'll pray for you. And then we don't do it. But if we're really people of faith, I believe that my prayer on your behalf and your prayer on my behalf matters. It changes things. It makes a difference. I want you to, when you pray for somebody, when you say you're going to pray for somebody, picture what it is. Use your imagination. Picture what it is you want to have happen in their life. Maybe they're hard-hearted. Maybe they're, maybe they're angry. And they're like, I just, I just pray that God would, would I mean, just picture like, like roots of a tree going into a concrete wall and breaking the hardness of heart. Picture and decide and, and ask God for what it is that he might do in their life. 
Don't be afraid to use your imagination to paint a picture of what you want God to do. Because God is working. And we need to intercede. We need to pray for one another. So we're a family of faith. And I think one of the reasons why we don't pray for each other is because we lack faith. We don't really believe sometimes that God's going to do anything. But the other reason why we don't pray for each other is because we lack love. But we're a family of love. We're a family of love. So John mentions love in verse 11, uh, but he really brings it, and he brings it to the forefront here after the Cain and Abel illustration. And what he does with this, and before we dive into the text again, uh, what he does is he, he, he puts for him, for him, love and life are like a synonym. They kind of work together, and death and hatred go together as well, okay? So those are two concepts that kind of work together. So let's look at Love is an outpouring of life. Look at verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. So life is a, is a catch-all term for John. It's a catch-all term that basically means anything uh, that is a part of this new life, this new status, this new realm we live in that Christ has given us. So Christ has blessed us with a new status. We've transferred from an old state, the realm of sin and death, and moved into a new state of life and righteousness. Paul does the same thing in Romans 6. He talks about uh, being dead to sin and raised to walk in newness of life, right? It's the same concept, transfer. So what does this life look like? What is, what is, life, what is life characterized by? What does love look like characterized in this new life? Well, there's some ideas uh, that, that come from the word life in Scripture. One, life is a gift. Life is a gift. If life is a gift, that means that, that I should be giving life. If, I'm, if, if I have the, the gift of life inside of me, if, if Christ has given me his life, if I'm walking in newness of life, then I should be a life-giving person. I should be a conduit for the life of Christ into the lives of other people. I shouldn't hoard the flourishing. I shouldn't hold on to the things that God has me to give them out, right? So when you come here at church on Sunday mornings, would you consider yourself to be a life-giving person? Are you looking for things to be thankful for? Are you looking for things to be grateful for? Are you looking for, for ministers or, or volunteers that you can pull aside and say, hey, thanks so much for giving your time in this area. It really made a difference in my life. Or are we critical? Are we looking around being like, I didn't really get anything out of that? Or are we looking around and saying, that's eh, not what, no. Mm -mm. Or man, I was really frustrated this didn't go well today. Are you a life-giving person or are you not? Is there flourishing where you go or is there only criticism? Life is a gift. And you give it out to other people. Life is also grace. It's grace. Life is a gift. It's been graciously given to us by God. And so God expects his family to also give that grace out to other people, to give that gift out and to give graciously. So we should pour our love, our grace into the lives of other people, the grace of God in the lives of people. This means forgiveness. This means forgiveness. And often we wait to forgive people until they've come and asked for it. No. When Jesus was going to the cross, what did he say? Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they do. I didn't see a Roman centurion being like, hey, Jesus, sorry about this. Forgive people before the resentment builds up inside of you. This means talking to people outside of our group, right? Look, in a church this size, you kind of gravitate towards people that are like you. You gravitate towards people you connect with. I do too. Trust me, I have people that I click with, and then there's some of you that don't like baseball, and we don't click, and that's okay. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, if, if we are all connected by the body of Christ, by the blood of Christ and the Spirit, we're unified in the Spirit. You know what that means? We have a point of commonality that is unassailable. And so I should be able to be friends with all of you. I'd like to think that I am. And you're friends with me. We're a part of a family. So let's break out of our group. Look for people that don't look like you. Look for people you don't talk to. Walk up to people that you don't know and be like, hey, I don't know you, but I've seen you here several times. Who are you? What do you do? Where are you going? Can I walk with you? Maybe that would creep them out a little bit. <laughs> I'm trying to go to my car. Leave me alone. Just, fine. This also means being generous to one another. Being gracious means to be generous. So it's, life is a gift. Life is gracious. Life is also together. In Hebrews 10.25, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, hey, uh, don't, don't, don't give up meeting together. They were experiencing such pressure from the outside world that they were giving up meeting together. They were, they were like, hey, it's just not worth it. But it is worth it. We do this. We have a lot of pressure from the outside world, not necessarily uh, persecution, but we get busy. Carrie talked about it this morning. 
It's like we get busy. There's so much going on. There's so much distraction that we give up meeting together, right? Ah, kids got a baseball game this Sunday. Kids got another tournament this week. Oh, well, I'm going to go to this trip. And you, you know, you turn around and it's four weeks before you've ever seen somebody in your local body of believers. If I can steal a phrase from Paul, brothers, that should not be. It should not be the case. I need you here. And I don't mean like I need you here as a pastor at this church. I need you here as an individual person in this community who needs other people to walk through life with. I need you physically present. And not just physically present, I need you and other people here need you engaged. So not checked out and be like, hey, okay, cool, whatever. But no, physically focused, engaged, ready to worship, listening, praying for one another, right? Because when you're not here, we're not the best church we can be. When you're not engaged, we're not the best church that we can be. Uh, The poet John Donne says, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Any person who does not come on Sunday morning, who's not a part of this physically, diminishes what happens here. Because you're a part of this, and I'm a part of this. And again, I understand there's, there's weeks where you're sick or whatever. I, I totally understand that. But if your pattern of behavior is to look for more reasons not to come on Sunday morning than to look for reasons to come, do you love the brothers? Do you love the body of believers? And so if life is an, is, is an outpouring of love, is an outpouring of life, then the opposite's true. Hatred is an outpouring of death. Look at verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in abiding in him. Now, this passage obviously doesn't mean that no murderer can... That's not what's going on. John is talking about those who continue on in resentment and hatred and frustration towards other people. There's, there's no eternal life abiding in that person. You can't just continue on in a spirit of resentment towards other people and consider yourself to be a follower of Christ. So if you're in the family of God, there should be, there's no place for ongoing resentment. There's no place for, for a hard heart towards other believers. I should have no ill will, no hatred, no malice toward anyone in the family of God. And if I'm seeking other people's disadvantage, if I'm seeking other people's uh, failings, if I'm trying to limit who they are, that's what hatred is. That's death. That's sourced in Cain, that's, that's the family of Cain, that's sin, that's death, that's evil, that's not what God has called us to. If we're going to be in the, in the family of God, we have to set aside the things that contribute to death and hatred and pick up the things that contribute to love and life. And John has a very specific way that he wants us to do that. We're a family of sacrifice. That's our final thought for the day. We're a family of sacrifice. So most families uh, take on the appearance of, of, or, or take on the characteristics of the person who founded it, right? So my last name is Cook, obviously. So that means somewhere a long, long time ago in merry old England, somebody made a living making food for other people. And apparently they were good at it. That skill set has not passed on to me. But they were good at it, so good at it that their family got named, hey, that's, that's Cook. That's a Cook. That's a Cook. And if you have a name like Butler, guess what? You waited on people. If your last name's Taylor, guess what you did? You made clothes for people. If your last name's Cooper, anybody know Cooper? You made barrels. There you go. Uh, Jobs got passed down from from generation to generation, and they take on kind of the family characteristics, right? Until somebody in your family saw a Disney movie and decided that they could be whatever they wanted to be, and they stopped doing what the family did, and, and now we just all have these random names that have nothing to do with who we are. But it's not just character, it's not just jobs, it's also like characteristics, right? We all know the families that, that are like known for generosity, right? And it seems to just pass down from generations. Like grandfather was really generous and kind, father was generous and kind, son's generous and kind. Like it's just, we also know the families that are like perpetually angry. Anger just seems to get passed down generation to generation, right? I have a whole wing of my family that just, you could just call the drunken angry wing. Like that's, that's who they are, right? I think, uh, I think a couple of them tried to kill each other at a family reunion one time. I was not there. That's hearsay. But you also have the, like people in the characteristics of the family of, of just longevity. It's like everybody in that family lives to be 105 and everybody wants to know what the secret is and nobody knows. Or that they, many of them die early. It's like, wow, everybody just seems to die young, right? 
In any case, our family of faith takes on, our family, uh, this body of believers, takes on the characteristics of the person who founded it, the author and perfecter of our faith. Look at verse uh, 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So the characteristic of our family is sacrifice, laying down my life for other people, laying down who I am, laying down my advantage, laying down what I gain for other people, laying down my life. Jesus says this about himself. He says he's the good shepherd that lays down his life for his sheep. That's in John 10, 11, which comes right after John 10, 10, where he says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So Jesus even juxtaposes the two things, sin and death and evil and hatred Love, life, forgiveness, mercy, repentance. Laying down your life for other people. This flows right out of the discussion of hatred and love. If I hate somebody, I will seek their disadvantage. But if I love someone, I will seek their advantage at the disadvantage of myself, right? That's what real love is. Look at verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So John tells us something very important here. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, I think one of the reasons why we don't rush to help other people around us, why we don't lay down our lives for other people, is because we often don't see them. We don't take notice. Our apathy is so deeply rooted that we don't even notice that somebody else has needs. We just kind of go on with our day. We're buried in our phone. We're buried in our own problems. We're buried in our own issues. We need to pray that God would open up our eyes. Pray that God would help us to see people in need. Talking about international justice mission this morning is exactly that. It's an opportunity for you to see that this world is a lot bigger than you thought it was, and it's a lot darker than you thought it was, and that there's an opportunity to help. Jesus says in Matthew 25, that if you gave clothes to the least of these, if you, if you serve the least of these, you gave a drink of water, if you gave food to the least of these, you did it for me. But if you don't do it, then you didn't do it for me. We need to pray that God would open our eyes, that we might see the people around us who are in need. And then, in verse 18, he reminds us that we shouldn't just talk about it. Look at verse 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So we have a bad habit. Of, of talking about stuff and not doing anything about it, right? We're Baptists. We like a word called committees. So we like to form a committee to try and decide what to do about something. We like to, to investigate before we, 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 we take action. And some of that's healthy. You should do your due diligence. But oftentimes we look for loopholes. We're looking for loopholes to not help, to not sacrifice ourselves, to not sacrifice what we have to help other people. And Deuteronomy uh, actually has a thought about this. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 15, I think it is. should be on the screen here. New. All right, I'll find it in my Bible and I'll read it to you. It ain't on. Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there and explain what the seventh year is. Every seven years in ancient Israel, they were supposed to cancel debts. So if you owed money and you borrowed money the first year and you couldn't pay it back, you couldn't pay it back, couldn't pay it back, couldn't pay it back, in the seventh year all debts were canceled and and you were forgiven the debt. So what he's talking about here in verse 7 is thinking to yourself, oh man, the years of... uh, I'm not going to get this money back that, I, that I'm loaned to it. Let's keep reading in verse 9. The seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. Basically, that's a verse against loopholes. Man, I'll just wait. I'll wait until like later, and I'll give him his, I'll give him his money when the seventh year is over. I'll help him out then, because I want to get back what I have, what I, what, what I owed him, or what he owed me. We're often talking about doing a lot of good stuff, but do we actually sacrifice ourselves for other people? The point of generosity is not to to get out of it something. The point of loving is not to get something out of it. The point is we do it because Jesus Christ did it. We want to talk about love disadvantaging yourself 
for the advantage of other people. The reason why we do it is because that's what Christ did. There is no more advantageous position than to be the Son of God at the right hand of the Father in perpetual joy and union with Him. There's no greater privilege, no greater honor. Jesus never, the Son of God never experienced uh, pain, death. He never experienced uh, uh, hatred. He never experienced uh, a cold, a splinter. And then he puts on flesh, dwells amongst men, and he has to go through all that. What once was an unassailable position, he becomes all of a sudden very fragile because he's a human being. Think about all the splinters that he got. Think about, he was a carpenter, right? So he got a lot of splinters probably. He also probably got sick. He also probably had neighbors that maybe didn't like him, that criticized him. He used to put up with all this. And so the reason why we put up with what we put up with, the reason why rather than putting up with it, we lay down our lives, we disadvantage ourselves for other people is because Jesus disadvantaged himself so that we might be supremely advantaged, restored to a relationship with God. And so every time I deny myself something, I disadvantage myself, I don't live up to my means, I don't, I don't use all of my skill sets to bring myself glory, I, I lay down those things for other people, guess what happens? I'm proclaiming the gospel to the world around me and saying, this is what your Lord has done for you, and this is a very small way that I'm doing it. But there's a greater story being told around me. We talked about that in the last sermon. If we're going to be a family, we have to be a family of sacrifice. So ask yourself, prayerfully ask yourself, do I have resources that can be afforded for other people? Can I disadvantage myself? Rather than living up to our means or beyond our means, maybe we live below our means and whatever's left over, we give it away to the advantage of other people. Maybe there's a skill set you have that, that's very specialized. You can volunteer, you can use that skill set for other people. Maybe it's just time. Maybe you have a flexible work schedule and you're able to get here really early on Wednesdays and you can, you can serve food to people. You should do these things. Because we are a family of sacrifice. And our sacrifice is always rooted in our faith. See how it's cyclical? Family of faith, family of love, family of sacrifice. And it goes around and around and around. If I'm a person of faith, I will love. And if I love, I will sacrifice. And that's what makes a healthy church family. Let's pray. Gracious God. You are kind and generous to us because you have given us, you've given us the gift of faith. You've accepted us based on what Christ has done and you've put in our hearts your love, your world-altering love. And you showed us how to sacrifice because you sacrificed for us. So Lord God, we give you praise. I pray for each person here. I pray that they would be people of faith, that they would be people of love and that we would be people of sacrifice. We love you. It's in your son's name. Amen.